गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन आई एम गायत्री ओपल एंड आई वर्क एज एसोसिएट डायरेक्टर ग्राम्स एट द शेरगिल सुंदरम आर्ट फाउंडेशन और एस एस ए एफ ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ दी एस एस ए एफ आई वुड लाइक टू एक्सटेंड अ वॉम वेलकम एंड थैंक यू फॉर ज्वाइनिंग अस फॉर दिस इवनिंग इवेंट अ लेक्चर टाइटल वॉट वी टॉक अबाउट वेन वी टॉक अबाउट फोटोग्राफी बाई डेविड कैंपनी क्यूरेटर राइटर एंड एजुकेटर chaired the lecture will be chaired by madhuban mitra artist and educator i will begin by briefly introducing ssaf ssaf was established in 2016 with the mandate to carry forward the legacy of scholar and photographer umra singh shegil his daughter and the pioneering figure of modern indian art amrita shegil and her nephew and niece artist vivan sundaram and filmmaker and television journalist navina sundaram since its inception the foundation's mandate has been to support and enable conjunctions of artistic and cultural practice that deal with historical memory with a view towards building futures based on secular principles and freedom of expression ssaf is committed to advancing creative independence and supporting alternative and heterodox practices and i encourage you to visit our website ssaf.in to learn more about our programs it is my pleasure now to introduce david campany jury chair for the umrao singh shergil grant for photography 2023 david will be delivering an illustrated lecture titled what we talk about when we talk about photography david is a curator writer and educator he is the author of several books including on photograph in 2020 indeterminacy thoughts on time the image and racism co-written with stanley volokhow vanambwa 2022 a handful of dust 2015 walker evans the magazine work 2014 photography and cinema 2008 and art and photography 2003 his recent exhibitions include immersion gregory holpern Vasanta Yogananthan Raymond Meeks at ICP New York 2023 William Klein Yes photographs paintings films 1948 to 2013 at ICP New York in 2022 and the six museum biennale Fur actual photography Germany 2020 David teaches at the University of Westminster London and is curator at large International Center of Photography New York I will now hand over to David and invite him to deliver his lecture and I request everyone to please keep your phones on silent for this evening's event thank you great um it's very strange when you hear your um CV being read out like that it sounds <coughs> it sounds more impressive than it really is uh, most of the time i just feel like a bunch of curiosities and doubts about photography uh i just worked out that i've published my 300th essay and i don't think i'm any closer to understanding photography than i was at the beginning maybe it's not a, a medium uh in the sense that one can really define it it's kept changing in its short life as mediums go it's not very old um it's never really stayed the same either technologically or culturally aesthetically it always seems to be on the move so i always feel like i'm chasing something and um i think that means i've never been very happy with any of my writings every time i feel i've got close to something the target moves <laughs> and i feel like i'm chasing it again somehow um maybe that's inevitable but also maybe that's what keeps it interesting i guess if if it wasn't like that um m- maybe photography would have been around for a short while in the 19th century and then um disappeared but it's but it's still with us and it still feels contemporary for all kinds of reasons um <coughs> you're probably wondering what that very enigmatic image on the on the poster is Um I spent quite a lot of my time working with photographers helping them to shape their work into books so editing pictures and this is by uh 
a Polish photographer, not very well known, called Magdalena Vivrot, and she's been photographing her life with her daughter uh, for the last um, <coughs> eight or nine years, and we're just in the process of um, formalizing it as a book. Um, so when Gayatri asked for an image, that was the one that was uh, most present on my mind. <coughs> uh, I've borrowed the title, uh, what we talk about when we talk about photography, uh, from a book by Raymond Carver called What We Talk About When We Talk About Love. I don't know if love and photography are the same thing. If they are, good for you. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> I have a love... I don't have a love-hate relationship, but I have a, I have a, it's a difficult love, I suppose, that I have with photography. There, there's definitely an, a, an, effect, an affection for it and a, and a fascination with it. And, and as I say, I find it a, an intriguing thing to try to talk about. It's always quite elusive. Um, and in fact, when I was here last, at the very gracious invitation of the Delhi Photo Festival. I hope I've not aged. <laughs> Nine years ago. Um, just as I was finishing the keynote address, uh, a whole set of thoughts rushed into my mind. And I thought I should have been talking about those things. Uh, the French have a lovely expression for it, l'esprit de l'escalier, the spirit of the staircase. You know, just as you're leaving the, the gathering of the witty and intellectual and beautiful people, it occurs to you what the great thing was that you wanted to say, but it's too late. Uh, but it's, it's been worrying away at me, so I've, I've come back. So uh, I'm not expecting you to have been there <laughs> uh, in 2015, uh, but what I say will kind of carry on from that. Gosh, I'm so glad I changed my shirt at the last minute, because I see I've got a blue one on there, and I nearly wore that. That would have been a fashion disaster, wouldn't it? Anyway, uh, the language we have and the terms we use for talking about photography always seem to be inadequate. Um, that's a strange thing to say because so much language swirls around photography and is, is part of photography in a way. And this was the case right from the beginning. As, as soon as photography was announced at the end of the 1830s, it was, it was talked about, it was debated, it was discussed. What was it? What could it be? Was it an art? Was it a science? What roles would it have? Um, it was already being um, contested and philosophized, and that's really not gone away. That's one way of uh, talking about it or trying to talk about it. And the other way is that, that photography is somehow a, a part of language, and language is a part of photography, and you only have to look at the development of something like photojournalism or documentary, where photography and language grew up together, side by side. Uh, photographs can show things, but they can't explain things. And explanation is, a, is an important part of how photography is enabled in the world, so um, <coughs> try reading your newspaper without reading it, but just looking at it, it's not going to make that much sense for all the claims that photography might be some kind of universal language. Now, Gayatri mentioned the words documentary and staged. Um, I'm kind of happy and not happy with those two terms. Um, they're probably difficult to get away with or to get away from. Um, and they're bound to hover around photography for one reason or another. Uh, obviously, photography, part of photography became what got called documentary. Um, and that might be to do with um, a photographer observing somehow, but maybe trying not to intervene in the world somehow. That's a kind of very classical definition of documentary. Staged is a peculiar word because as soon as you say it, it, it conjures up something highly theatrical, like a stage. But maybe 
if you imagine a photographer in a street, let's say, and somebody walks past them and they see the photographer and they stop and look at the photographer, well, the photographer's definitely affected the world. Wouldn't be quite right to call it staged, though. Uh, there's some kind of interaction going on. Uh, the photographer is not innocent of the situation and the subject is not innocent of, of the camera. Um, but a word like documentary or stage doesn't really capture that. And I think we use those words because we think they can be two ends of a spectrum where we imagine the most documentary, documentary photography, and then we imagine the most staged, staged photography. Um, don't think it's like that. It, it feels maybe like two ends of a horseshoe that are actually very close together, or maybe it's not even that. Maybe they're just so uh, muddled um, that those terms can only be used in a provisional way and they're not maybe that useful in the end. Um, I remembered actually putting this lecture together. Th this was kind of my first entry into thinking about photography. I, I, I loved photography from an early age and I loved cinema. Uh, but when I was maybe about 14, just before I got a camera, uh, my school library, which is where we used to go when it rained at lunchtime, um, had a very small section on photography and they had a book by Harold Evans, the picture editor of Times, Sunday Times, called Pictures on a Page. And in it, there is this photograph by Don McCullen. It gets titled in different ways. Uh, most often it's titled this way, Turkish Defender Leaving the Side Entrance of the Cinema, Limassol, Cyprus, 1964. But in that book, pictures on a page, um, Harold Evans discusses how Don McCullen, photojournalist, didn't want that photograph to be used because he thought it looked too much like a film still and declined to let it be published at the time. It's been published a lot since. I remember reading this and thinking, why didn't I mean, I liked cinema, and I did like film stills for sure, I, and I'd seen quite a lot in books about cinema, but it made me think about why a photojournalist would have to say no to this picture. I mean, he, it wasn't made like a film still. I mean, nobody shouted action, and they're not actors, and there's not a cinematographer, but there was something about it that made McCullen think, I'd rather not use that, maybe because it looks a bit staged. But sometimes the world looks like that. It's kind of interesting that it's somebody leaving the side <laughs> entrance of a cinema <laughs> and he's worried about it looking like a film still, uh, almost as if he's escaped from the screen somehow and he looks like a kind of movie street fighter or something. Well, that's interesting. When you're about 14 and you don't understand these things, that's, that's going to make you think. And that's stuck in my mind, uh, gosh, 40 plus years later. I still come back to that query uh, that McCullen had. And it obviously had stuck in the mind of Harold Evans, the picture editor, newspaper editor, uh, enough for him to include it in that book. I carried on with an interest in in McCullen. I think a lot of people when they're young, the first photography, perhaps of my generation and older, the first photography that you took seriously was in those um, magazines, the kind of weekend magazines or the weekly magazines. And I remember seeing McCullen's images, not when they were new. Uh, I was born a year before this was taken. And um, about a decade ago, I was putting together some lectures about photojournalism for students in London, and I was very unhappy with showing the students images like this, just on a you know, digital projection on a white background with no context, 
Um, so I, I took it upon myself to, if I was showing an image, a photojournalistic image, I would go find, I would track down the magazine where it appeared, give it some kind of context. So there it is. Um, interestingly, McCullum does some of the writing too. This was a photograph, hard to look at, I know, um, which McCullen you know, famously admitted to arranging because he wanted to show all of the possessions of the felled soldier, uh, but thought that was, that was okay, just to kind of make the picture readable. Um, in that same magazine, same issue, I think, I think it's March 24th, 1968, which I bought, I think on eBay, because I wanted to see the McCullen pictures. About 10 pages later is this piece by Eve Arnold, which I'd never seen before. And the magazine had sent her to North Carolina in America to take photographs in a fake North Vietnamese village that the American military had built. In fact, I think they built three. And it's where conscripts, you know, young people that were in civil life uh, conscripted into the army, they would go to one of these fake v North Vietnamese villages for a little acclimatization before they would then get shipped out uh, to the Vietnam War. Uh, they're highly theatrical pictures. You're, you're looking at two conscripts on their first day of training and they've been asked to camouflage themselves. And one of them was in the hospital and just got some white cream and rubbed it in his face and tied a white pillowcase around his head. Absurd, absurd. Um, another guy was out the back and he rubbed uh, leaves into his face and uh, attempts to camouflage himself with twigs under his hat. Some real injured um, Vietnam veterans are stationed in the fake North Vietnamese village for authenticity. So the new recruits get used to the idea that they might get injured. There's a fake pastor, there are fake pat uh, battles, there's a fake Buddhist temple. You can see where I'm going with this already. There's something highly theatrical, maybe about Eve Arnold's photographs, but that seems appropriate because what she's photographing is itself highly theatrical. It is a stage set for war. In fact, all armies train, all armies have uh, rehearsal facilities as well as training facilities. And the editors of the magazine were wise enough to ask the readers of the magazine to think about Don McCullen's work and Eve Arnold's work in relation to each other. America in Vietnam, Vietnam, in America. Don McCullum goes to the war, Eve Arnold goes to the fake village. Interesting. That's, that's a smart piece of editorial work there. Of course, you don't see Eve Arnold's work very much in the history of photojournalism because it, it doesn't fit what we think of as classical photojournalism, which is usually heroic and gritty and violent and black and white and made by men. And Eve Arnold's is none of that. But it's just as an important, just as important as a part of the story in a way. What do we think we're looking at here? I'm very interested in what photographs do before we read about them or before any language swirls around them. It could be anything, what we're looking at here. There may be something that makes us think, not a documentary picture, maybe not, I don't know. It is actually a photograph by a photojournalist, Alfred Eisenstadt, taken on the set of uh, Rainer Werner Fassbinder's um, film, uh, uh, Berlin Alexanderplatz, 1980. So he, he's there as a photojournalist. He's not part of the film production, but he's taking a film of a situation that has been prepared in advance at 
characters, costumes, sets, and so forth. Kind of a hybrid image, difficult to put on that spectrum of documentary and staged. Huh, well, well, forgive me for talking about something so iconic uh, here in India. Um, I bought this photograph recently online uh, because I'd seen it in my youth and I knew where it came from and I, and I knew what I was buying. It's an 8x10 print uh, of a publicity photo from Sachachit Ray's uh, Pata Panchali, 1955. But it's a publicity photo issued by the Museum of Modern Art the year the film was made uh, for the show The Family of Man, the famous exhibition, the most visited exhibition ever. I don't suppose there'll ever be one uh, that will be that visited. This photograph uh, furnished only in connection with reviews of the exhibit The Family of Man, titled, interestingly, India, Elders Caring for Child, photo by Sachachit Ray, used in the exhibit The Family of Man. N uh, no mention of the film, certainly nobody in America would have known about Sachachit Ray, or maybe even India at that time, it's his first movie, is it not? I believe. So that photo gets published uh, and it gets exhibited and various versions of the exhibition travel the globe. Pages from the book there. That's how it appears, certainly that's how it appears in my copy. Uh, now it's just titled India, such as it Ray. So uh, no reference to the fact that it might be made in conjunction with a movie. Even if we know it's in conjunction with a movie, we don't know if it's a frame from the movie or whether it's a, a photo a little bit like the Eisenstadt picture taken on the set during the making of the film. We know that such as it Ray took photographs on the set. He also had a production photographer. I'm trying to get to the bottom of who actually made that. Maybe we can say it's such as it Ray because he made the film. Um, but none of this is mentioned um, in conjunction with the family of man. So a photograph has no way of guaranteeing its own status with regards to its genesis, its authorship, or its intention. Photographs, for whatever they show, have a nasty habit of covering their traces, covering their footsteps, sweeping the dust behind them. So you see this extraordinary image and there's no way to guarantee how it came to be. And I think this is another reason why um, writing swirls around pictures so much. Well, it looks like a Diane Arbus picture. In fact, when I first saw it, it was actually hanging in a restaurant I thought, wow, they've got an amazing picture by Diane Arbus, although I couldn't remember that particular picture. Um, it's not actually, it's by a British artist called Gillian Waring, who loves to imitate other artists and other artists' work. And it's a homage to Diane Arbus. In fact, the word homage is in, in the title to Diane, love Gillian, 2005. If you told me that was a the Ann Arbus picture, I'd have gone along with it. Um, Waring was using the same kind of camera, same kind of flash setup, um, developing this film with a similar developer and paper and getting it as close as she could. You could say that's a kind of studying of the masters. Uh, Studying the masters is, is something that you hear in painting schools, but photographers look very, very closely at the work of other photographers, and they have to figure out their relation to the very good work that's been done already. And sometimes that does involve imitation. Uh, and I would encourage anyone who feels like they want to imitate someone else to do it to death, 
get it out of your system. Uh, you'll, you'll learn what it is to try and make a Diane Arbus picture to do that. Don't run away from it. I think if I was to pick one photograph that is a kind of emblem of these difficult ways of defining and talking about photography and this idea of the image covering its own traces, I think it would probably be this, which looks simple enough. Uh, it's by Jeff Wall. It's called Men Waiting, taken in 2006. Uh, if you saw it in exhibition, it's, it's wider than this. It's wider than the screen. It's just under it's 388 centimeters. It's nearly four meters across. So that if it hangs in the gallery, uh, the men look the size they would if you were standing looking at them from where the camera was. So Jeff Wall likes to use life scale. He describes it as a near documentary, so a slightly modified term, near, in proximity to documentary. Let's take a closer look. Wall talks, Jeff Wall talks very well and quite frequently about his own work and, and often describes how this photograph came to be made and why he calls it a near documentary picture. He lives in Vancouver and um, making the drive from his home to his studio, he would often pass these men standing on a corner waiting for work, waiting for paid work, you know, maybe on a building site or in a warehouse. In, uh, in Canada, they call them cash corners. So that's a kind of interesting instance of contemporary capitalism and the labor market. You know, th these men are in a very precarious situation. They are there waiting for work. And Jeff Wall kept seeing them and then asked them if he could photograph them. He didn't tell them to do anything, just carry on waiting. So he set up his 4x5 camera on the other side of the road and started to take photographs. Um, but he realized it wasn't really working out as a picture, wasn't really getting a good picture from it. The men were is interesting, but the place was not. So. He decided to uh, hire the men. He would pay them their morning rate or their daily rate. Uh, he would pick them up in the morning in a van. He would take them to a corner where he thought he could make a good picture of them and didn't tell them to do anything but wait as if they were waiting for work, although now they were being paid. So the corner where he made the picture is not the corner where he first saw the men, but he feels the picture is kind of true. Uh, and it has to work as a picture. So you can see maybe that they're at the kind of edge of the city. There's maybe low intensity industry, housing, trees at the edge of the picture, maybe signifying the edge of the city. Maybe that's where they would stand in this kind of hinterland, neither in, neither out space. You can see why he wanted to do it there. But he's not arranging the men. He's just asking them to wait. And he's taking tens, hundreds of pictures, hoping to get a good one, the way lots of documentary or street photographers do. Jeff Wall says he takes about 600 to get a good one. That's the same ratio as Robert Frank when he was making The Americans, 600 to 1. Kind of similar. Jeff Wall has also talked about it in terms of neorealism, that moment from kind of post-war cinema, particularly in Italy, but then also in France and the UK too, that moment where filmmakers left the studio they wanted to work with people who were not actors. You know, if, if a filmmaker wants to make a film about a baker, they find a baker because they can do the baking. They know how to do it. 
and that will give the film a kind of authenticity, but they'll be doing it when the director says action. So neorealism neo and neo-documentary are kind of similar terms. I think about that idea of neo-documentary when I look at the work of Robert Bresson, French filmmaker, who uh, didn't like actors, uh, and he didn't even like the term acting. He, li he liked the term model. And once he had found someone for a role in his films, he would get them to perform the action over and over again until they were no longer self-conscious, and they were just doing it. They were just doing it. So that happens. If you ask someone to do something over and over again, they'll be acting and posing at the beginning, and then by the end, they'll, they'll just be doing it almost automatically. Uh, this is my favorite um, Bresson film, Mouchette. Uh, and it's my favorite moment from the film where Mouchette, young teenage girl who has to look after her sick mother and a younger brother, and she's very ostracized in her village. She's making the coffee in the morning. Watch her throw the lid on the coffee pot. Let's watch that again. I don't think that's acting. You can't act throwing a lid on a coffee pot because you have to be able to throw a lid on a coffee pot. An actor can play someone who is very clever, or they can play someone who's very stupid, they can play someone who's very evil-minded, play someone who's very good, but they can't play the part of a juggler unless they can juggle. And when you see them juggling, they're not acting, they're just doing it. So there's a big part of filmmaking which is always going to be documentary. A, a document of somebody or people doing things. In fact, Jean-Luc Godard said even the most theatrical staged film is a documentary of that theatrical staging. Well, it seems a little perverse to think about it like that, but I, I think it's kind of true. I could watch that forever. I think it's the nicest moment in cinema. But there's something about that, even at the beginnings of cinema, and, and here's where it comes into relation to photography. This is a short film by the Lumiere brothers, pioneers, patenters of the cinematograph, 1895. This is a beautiful, what you're going to see is a very beautiful, digitally stabilized version of a film of a bunch of photographers. They belong to a congress, and they're arriving at the Congress and they've had a day trip and they're seeing for the first time Louis Lumiere hand cranking the cinematograph. So it's a little bit theatrical. It's, it's kind of near documentary. It's very difficult to say it's just a documentary film because they're all aware of the camera and they all play up to it. And in fact, you can look out for a guy with a camera who wants to take a picture See if you can spot him. Here he comes. <coughs> totally fascinating. Sometimes I think cinema has not got any better.
That's a man called uh, Jules Janssen, who was a kind of pioneer of high-speed photography, but also astronomical photography. I don't know if he actually took a photo. Uh, I was writing a book about photography and cinema, and I was trying to find that picture, didn't find it. So maybe it was just a gesture. Maybe it was the kind of shooting back. I don't know if Lou, Louis Lumiere knew that that was going to happen, but I like that moment as a, the first kind of standoff between the still image and the moving image in a film that feels a little bit documentary but has that theatricality to it at the same time. The same year, interestingly, the Lumieres played around with some highly theatrical, knowingly, self-consciously theatrical films. This is one called Photographer. Again, it's very short. It's about. It's, it's also about stillness and movement, interestingly. Photographer's trying to arrange his subject, won't keep still. <laughs> Nothing's changed. <laughs> and there was a kind of a way of thinking about the, you know, the difference between so-called documentary films and so-called staged or theatrical films as if they were separate things. But like I said, this is a documentary of these theatrical men performing in this very you know, comical, self-conscious way. So it doesn't make sense to just think of one as documentary and one as staged or one being realism and the other being some, some kind of you know, magical construct because there's always realism in the magic and there's always magic in the realism. They're never going to be that separate. Interestingly, at the beginnings of documentary, when the term first really started to get used, uh, it's attributed to John Grierson, the Scottish filmmaker, he talked about it as the creative treatment of actuality with a social purpose. Creative treatment. Nothing supposedly neutral. Nothing supposedly cut off. There was a kind of understanding that it would have to be creative. Or it would have to accept that it's creative. That's For a long while in the 20th century, that's not how people thought of it. If you said you were a creative documentary photographer or an experimental pho documentary photographer for most of the 20th century, people would ask you to make up your mind, to choose. You can't be experimental and be a documentary photographer. You have to be one or the other. Are you documentary? Are you staged? Kind of a silly distinction, but maybe we can't get away from it. I love the fact that the Lumières were called the Lumières, Lumière meaning light, which brings me on just to these, I'm coming to a close now, but brings me on to this interesting project by Alex Maioli, it's advancing on its own. These pictures are taken in very, very, very bright daylight. He has an assistant with a flash unit. The flash is extremely bright, coming from a particular angle, and Maioli is exposing for the very, very bright flash, so everything else, including the background, falls into near darkness. And in falling into near darkness, it makes the photographs look highly theatrical, highly staged. It looks like the lighting of figures on a stage, not even for cinema. They lo it looks like staged lighting. That is... Oh, my slides are advancing on their own. I need to stop that. <coughs> Expand that. Get back to that in a sec. Um, so only light is doing that. Only light is theatricalizing the subjects there. Um, Maioli and his assistant stay in these situations. I'll let them play again. They stay in the situations until the people... Uh, are not self-conscious about somebody being there with a camera. It doesn't take long, actually. Five minutes, ten minutes. Uh, the flash is happening uh, 
so instantaneously that you're hardly seeing it with the eye. But the photographs are completely transforming the situation. But it makes you think, doesn't it, that you're, when, you, when you look at the world, you're not seeing the world. You're only seeing the light bouncing off it. You're only seeing the light bouncing off it. But light can the theatricalize um, a world that is not performing. So light, light can perform the world. Arguably, light does perform the world. A photograph has the word light in it, in a way is turns things into signs of themselves, maybe enigmatic signs, but signs nonetheless. And part of the way it does it is, is automatic, as we know. If you open the shutter, the light floods in. And it floods in in a way that is not really uh, hierarchical and doesn't have to be uh, intended. Yes, yes, the photographer has a brain and they make all kinds of decisions, but what, once they decide to open the shutter, the light floods in. There's a, a kind of famous artwork, which is also a kind of poster and a postcard and a slogan by Alfredo Jarre called, you do not take a photograph, you make it. And I guess we know why he wants to say that. He wants to say that the photographer is always implicated in the world. The photographer's making decisions, they should take responsibility for what they do. Uh, all photographs should be understood as being made and not taken. We understand where he's coming from and that there might be a kind of ethical imperative behind that. I found myself at a dinner in Paris with Alfredo Jarre and I told him I was a curator at the International Centre of Photography and he said, oh that's interesting, when they opened their new building they asked me to do something on the facade of the building and I suggested putting this there. You do not take a photograph, you make it. Uh, but they declined the offer and he said, was that you? I said, no, no, that was, that was before my time, but I do have an issue with this. He said, oh, yeah. I said, why, does, why, do we, why do we not say, you do not take a painting, you make it? And he said, well, it's obvious. I said, okay, well, what's obvious about it? Well, you know, painting is made differently. I said, right, it is made differently. On some level, a photograph is always taken, no? Otherwise, it would be really no different from a painting. And we all know there's a grey area in between and you can make a painting based on a photo and you can do a painting on a computer screen. We know that. And I said, I don't agree with that statement. I, th I think a photograph is, is made and taken. I can't see why it's not both. Why could your poster not say, you do not take a photograph, you take a photograph and make a photograph? Doesn't sound so elegant, but it would be truer. And he said, I'll have to think about that. That was the end of the dinner. In fact, I don't think he wanted to talk to me after that. Um, but I'm, I'm grateful for his, his gesture because it, it, it made me think hard about that. And I think it has a lot to say about the fact that we can't get away from terms like documentary and staged. Um, and at the same time, they're always going to be um, a little bit inadequate for us. Thank you. <laughs> I think Madhavan is going to entertain me in conversation for a while, and then we'll hear from you. So be formulating your questions. Thank you, David, for this thought-provoking and very interesting lecture. I would like to invite Madhuban Mitra to share a discussion with David. To briefly introduce Madhuban, she's a jury member for this edition of the Umrao Singh Shehji Grant for Photography. Madhuban works primarily with photography, film, and video as part of an artist duo with Manus Bhattacharya. She studied English literature and holds a PhD in cultural studies. 
Some of the duo's recent solo and group exhibitions include uh, Until the End of the World 2023 and Last Evenings on Earth 2019 at Photo Inc. New Delhi, a visual alphabet of industry, work, and technology from Daziano Mas Bologna 2022, Post Gate Photography and Inherited History in India, San Jose Museum of Art, California, and Ulrich Museum of Art, Kansas, USA, and The Great Machine 2 in Museo Chepa, Tarrega, Spain. Sorry, I'm not going to. Okay, I'm not going to read all through all of this. Um, their work is part of the collections of the Kiranara Museum of Art, uh, Fondazion Mas Bologna, and private collect collections around the world. They also teach courses on moving image and photography as visiting faculty in the master's program at the National Institute of Design, <coughs> Gandhi Nagar. Uh, I now invite David and Madhuban to uh, be in discussion. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's on? Yeah. 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 Great. Thank you for the fascinating lecture. Uh, fascinating uh, is probably a good word to use because uh, it indicates a kind of spell which mm. photographs uh, cast on us. So, uh, I was just wondering whether we could, I, I will only ask uh, you a couple of questions and then open it out to the audience. I'm sure uh, people will have a mm -hmm. lot of questions. Uh, a photograph, I think you have in, in your multiple roles uh, as curator, writer, photographer, bookmaker, exhibition maker. Mm -hmm. you always uh, wanted to talk about photographs rather than about photography you know in the photography yes. in the abstract uh, mm -hmm. so most most of the time you are really talking about a photograph and then moving on to make observations about uh, what it might mean for mm -hmm. this thing called pho uh, yeah. photography whereas uh, in the history of photography we've more often than not seen people mm. really project what their own uh, understanding of what they want photography to be or do uh, on mm. photographs and therefore their, their interest has been more about photography rather than in photographs yeah and uh, mm, maybe you could repeat this wonderful story about Susan, about your meeting with Susan Sontag and uh, your conversation, uh, little oh, conversation about uh, yeah. on pho uh, photography, because that sort of points to a very yeah. important distinction, mm -hmm. I think, uh, and uh, yeah. and it 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 also points the way towards uh, opening out photographs towards meaning rather than really fixing them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it is interesting, I, I think, because I'm an image maker and I do think about images kind of one at a time, I'm, I'm not particularly good about thinking of photography in a, in a more abstract, kind of universal way. I, I, I think there are some people that are quite good at doing that, and I think you can get to certain things about it uh, if you're not that fussed about any particular image. I can't do that. I do think about it w what case by case, example by example. You probably get that feeling from how I was talking there. But yes, it's true. When I, when I was a student, in fact, just after I graduated, I was working at an art center, the ICA in London, and uh, uh, Susan Sontag was due to give a talk, n not about photography, but actually about a novel of hers, and, and she arrived early, she got the time wrong, and she, she came into the shop, and I knew, I knew it was her, she was very striking looking, I had a bit of a crush on her at the time, which was more than intellectual, uh, wow, so Susan Sontag's in the store, in the bookshop, and uh, I said, oh, Miss Sontag, you're, you know, you're early, there's nobody here from the talks department, 
there's Buckingham Palace down the road, there's Piccadilly Circus. She said, no, no, I'm tired, sat down. <laughs> okay, so I had a few hours with her in the store. And um, she was very curious, as intellectuals are, and uh, I told her I was studying photography and cinema, and I was an image maker and a writer, and I'd, and I'd read everything that she'd done, and I'd seen her films. And after about an hour, she said, you haven't mentioned my book on photography. Why is that? I was talking about everything else <laughs> in a very animated way, not about that. And uh, well, I never read, I mean, I was impressed by that book, but I never really liked it. And I said, well, uh, it's got no pictures in it. And she said, well, you know, that was a, that was a, that was a decision we made that it would keep the book cheap. And, and I said, no, no, it's, it's called On Photography, and you don't actually talk about many particular images. In fact, you don't really talk in a particular way at all. And um, I'm always, when I read your big statements about photography, I'm always thinking, well, this example fits, but this one doesn't. And why, why were you not talking about any particular images? And I remember her shoulders went down and she said, well, you know, I had a, to be honest, I had a hard time back then. This was the early 90s. And uh, she wrote the she wrote the essays that became that book in the mid-70s. Uh, I had a hard time writing about individual photographs. I looked at a lot, but when it came to the writing, I kind of pulled back a bit, and it was more general. And that's why the book's called On Photography. And she did say, well, maybe one day, David, you'll write a whole book about one photograph, or a book called On Photographs. And uh, she was right, I did. I have done a few books about single photographs. But I, it's true, I can't, uh, I'm not very good at, at, at thinking in those big abstract ways. I, 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 I kind of think photography is the sum total of the images. We get the general from the images. You could, I'm, I, I'm sure I could be forced into a corner and somebody could argue it the other way. Maybe it's just how I think. Um, um, but it's an interesting one, whether you, whether you think about photography or whether you think about photographs. Or, and what's, what, do you, what idea of photography do you have in your mind when you pick up the camera to take that photograph? You do have one. It may not be totally defined, but you, you have an idea of, about it. Anyway, it's an, in, it's an interesting philosophical question. It's, it sounds very um, like it belongs in the kind of windier reaches of some seminar, but I, I think that is, I think everyone has to contend with that somehow. Is it because, uh, you know, a photograph from your presentation, mm -hmm. uh, a photograph can be yeah. many things, yeah. and the additional problem, if you see it as a problem, mm -hmm. uh, a problem of uh, you know, articulating that in language yeah. uh, is that it's many things at once. It, it's not necessarily many things in many different times and many different contexts, but in in the same context, it can it can mean very very different things. It is, yeah, and, and that's that's very disturbing. I mean, I can give you a, a couple of quick examples of photography being being mm -hmm. literally being many things at once. A few. Well, a long time ago now, maybe 15 years, I went to give a talk at an art school in London that didn't have a photography program, but they wanted someone to come in and talk about photography, and I was a bit early, <laughs> strangely, Sontag was early. I was a bit early, so I, I went to the library, and I saw a big book of, um, you know, August Sander, the German photographer, making portraits of German citizens between the wars. There's, there's a big, fat book that was published in the 80s, People of the 20th Century, it's called. And I saw this book, and it was like an old telephone directory. It was so thumbed and used. And I, and photography people, capital P, uh, are very sort of proprietary about August Sander. He's such yes, an important yes. figure in the history of photography. And I thought, wow, there's no 
photography course here. Who's looking at this? Who's looking at this book? So I took it to the librarian and I said, can you tell me who's been taking this book out? And you know, there were like lots of pages of the rubber stamps with the dates and all that. And uh, she said, oh, I can't tell you that. That's conf confidential information. You know, librarians are a bit like that. And I, I don't want to know the names. Just, you know, can you tell me what they're studying? You know, what courses they're on? And, and she said, oh, yep, yep. Oh, interestingly, it's 80% fashion students. Wow, interesting. 80% fashion students. So, but we st that still doesn't tell us how they're looking at the pictures. Yeah. It's not like a photography person looks one way and a fashion person mm -hmm. looks another, but th they might be looking at, uh, yeah, fashions in Germany in the 20s and 30s. They might be looking for how people stood in front of the camera. It, they might be interested in what fabric looks like in a black and white picture, but they might still have sociological readings, anthropological readings, political readings. So Sander's project doesn't belong to photography. It belongs at the intersection of all these mm. discourses and, and ways. Of, so it is multiple at the same time. It's, it's a really fascinating thing. Another example, just quickly, that um, Stephen Shaw, the American color photographer, made lots of pictures on the road in the 70s. Uh, I was he was coming for lunch one day and we were going to record a conversation and before he arrived at breakfast uh, I had a number of his books on the table and my sister's boyfriend who'd been a mechanic started going through the pictures Stephen Shaw's pictures taken on the road in the 70s and he said to me do you think there were a lot of MGB sports cars in America in the 70s because there's a lot in this book. Or do you think this photographer liked MGB cars? Not a photography question, interestingly. Hmm. I said, well, he's coming for lunch. You can ask him. <laughs> <laughs> so we have lunch. We get to coffee, and uh, Joe clears his throat, and he says, uh, Mr. Shaw, I've been looking at your book, and there's a, there's a lot of MGB cars in your pictures. What's that about? Were there a lot in America? You know, is your project statistically accurate? Uh, or were you interested in them? And he said, huh, pointing at me, he said, Mr. Photography here wouldn't ask me that question. <laughs> but you're right. He said, my wife, Ginger, had two MGB cars at different times in the 70s. I was aware of them. We liked them. Uh, I didn't photograph those two but they do recur in my pictures. He wouldn't be any more specific than that. And, well, that tells you that those photographs mean something to a car mechanic, right? And his response to those pictures is as important as anyone else's. So at any given moment, a photograph is many, many different things. It won't be pinned down. It won't be. That is a very perplexing thing about them. That's also, I think, where its power comes from and this fascination uh, comes from that you cannot really fix it. So in, in the analog days, one talked about fixing yeah. images. You, the, it, it precisely its nature is that it is, it is constantly, you know, unfixed and it, it can be this, it can be that. Yeah. And yeah. I think one of the ways in which you address this in your writing, particularly mm -hmm. Um, I haven't been fortunate to see your exhibitions, but I've seen your, uh, a couple mm -hmm. of books that has come out of the exhibitions. And the way you try to address this is also to structure your own writing as a kind of count, uh, uh, point, counterpoint kind of structure, you know, in, in the sense that you, even in this presentation, mm -hmm. you first present uh, a kind of one kind of way in which Yep. the Macaulay image might be looked at and yep. then you kind of, uh, you know. Uh, I, think my, I think my story in photography is, like we all do, you encounter images and you have a response to them and you make up your mind about them and you often find, one, that you change your mind and two, that you were just wrong about mm -hmm. 
something. You make a presumption about mm. something and it turns out not to be that. Um, it's true, yeah, there is, a, there is a little putting of something forward and then m maybe undermining it or, well, not undermining it, just opening it out a little bit a little bit more. I tend to do that more in the writing, I think, than the exhibition. And I think it, it actually, because one, one of the things that you've spoken about and written about a lot is to, is, is this concern about do we have a language to talk mm. about uh, photographs. Mm. So this, this kind of structure somehow allows uh, uh, the reader or yeah. I, I think even in your exhibitions that might be the case where you bring together two very different kinds of photographs and, and to talk, to have a conversation with each other. Yeah, and yeah, no, that's true. Uh, yeah, the, a, a good example is, do you remember Men Waiting, the big Jeff Wall picture? Well, that's nearly four meters wide and it's mounted on 22 millimeter aluminium and it's in a very heavy frame and it's behind glass and the whole thing weighs, weighs 460 kilos and there's only two of them, and if you want to show one of those, it's going to have to come on a plane <laughs> from wherever it is. It's very big and it's very heavy, and you're going to have to get it on the wall. I, I wanted to show that in an exhibition in Paris next to something that was also a depiction of anonymous laborers, mm -hmm. which was a piece okay. made for... Fortune magazine in 1946 by Walker Evans it's called Labor Anonymous, where he stood stood in front of a wall and photographed people coming out of uh, Detroit, so presumably car factory workers. They come past the camera and he takes takes a picture of them. Uh, if if you if you want to show that, you buy a copy on eBay. Mine was twenty five dollars. And we had it in a vitrine, and I think that is no more and no less important as a work of photography than Jeff Wall's big thing. And it's curious, you know, we, we have a hierarchy of photography. Cult, you know, in the arts, there's a hierarchy that puts, like, museums at the top, and then galleries, and then books, and then magazines, and then the internet at the bottom. Mm. But we know, we know in photography good work can be made for any context. So I, I really wanted to have those two things in play where, I mean, I didn't, I didn't put the magazine literally in front of the Jeff Wall. I, it was slightly away from it so you couldn't see them both at the same time. But they were clearly very different moments, <coughs> forms, contexts, platforms, different ways of approaching the same thing, an anonymous workers. Uh, but I think that is photography, and if you follow the image and you don't follow the, you don't follow the canon and you don't follow what the museum tells you is important necessarily, you do end up with this quite dispersed, dispersed view of photography. Or I do, I do. Um, yeah, I like to. I'm glad we've this. arrived at Walker Evans oh. because. I have I have a question and then I'll open it out to the audience. Okay. Uh, since we were talking about, you, you know, you showed us several examples of how difficult it is to talk about documentary and staged as a kind of, yeah. you know, uh, exclu excluding each other kind of category. Uh, Walker Evans, I think in the 60s, mm -hmm. uh, you know, talked about documentary with this strange term called lyric documentary. Yeah. And uh, I'll, I'll then fast forward and go to the 70s, 80s when Luigi Girri uses mm. a term called sentimental geography and yeah. indefinite cartography with reference to images that are being made in a very straightforward way where the yeah. visible world is being captured by a camera. Yeah. Uh, and uh, with as little intervention as possible. Uh, do you think that there, there is in the history of photography, you would probably know of many more examples like this, mm. where photographers in trying to 
you know, distance themselves from this very strict categorizations of things are actually trying to work with, you know, because it's an oxymoron, you know, where mm -hmm. lyric documentary, if you yeah. look at the, uh, in, in the very uh, uh, mm. purest idea of, of the documentary. Uh, yeah. So uh, how, how is, how are these terms trying to work with, you know, two things that yeah. are in two opposite spectrums of relating to the more <laughs> visible world? That's a whole book. <laughs> um, if we if we go back to that John Grierson, you know, the, the creative treatment of actuality with a social purpose, um, that moment in the twenties is very interesting because there's there's an understanding that um, documentary doesn't have a fixed form or fixed conventions. You c you're going to have to find the form and the conventions. They're going to have to come out of what it is you want to say. But the mass media, and that's a term that starts to be used in the 20s and 30s, the mass media becomes very mass, very dominant, and it places on that experimental impulse of a fixed set of conventions. A photo, you know, a, a photo essay must look like this. A documentary feature must look like this. And it's it starts to congeal and, and crystallize and the terms are set in advance and suddenly the successful photographers are actually the formulaic ones yes. that can do what the magazines require. And of course those ma mass media magazines begin to die in the late 60s, 70s and uh, Things like documentary and photojournalism go into a bit of a tailspin, but we're, I think we're now at a point where people, there are no fixed conventions for documentary and photojournalism. They have returned to their natural state, which is creative and mm. experimental. It's not like being experimental is a kind of fancy garnish put on documentary it just it just is it is an experimental practice it's just that those mass media magazines kind of stamp their authority for you know a very very strong 50 60 years and it's, it's taken a while to kind of crawl out from under that heel and so Evans is Evans was well Evans found an interesting way to work within the magazine world mm. but set his own assignments do his own writing, his own editing, his own layout, didn't have to hand over the pictures, didn't have to do it according to the formula. It was a battle. He was always fighting his editors. Um, so, yes, yeah, so that generation were, were... It looks like they're being awkward with terms like lyric mm -hmm. documentary or documentary style or... What, what was the geary one? Sentimental geography. Sentimental geography. Yeah. <coughs> but they're, they're all kicking against, uh, well, maybe it's the dying days, but they're kicking against that forced structure that was imposed mm. on documentary and journalism. I think that's my take, mm -hmm. take on that. Good for them. They open the door. Yeah, because these uh, actually they're, they're very Reopen strange the terms and you don't quite know no. what, what, uh, how, how, they help you help you understand those photographs, but they are obviously they are coming from somewhere else. But they're all modified. Yeah, they're all yeah. modified terms yeah. like Jeff yeah. Wall's near documentary. Yeah, yeah. But with Jeff Wall, you know, there's a there's a very clear consciousness about yeah. uh, why he's using a term, why he's wh why he's taking the term documentary. Yes. You know, in where where I know he dislikes the word fake, but uh, uh, yeah. you know, it, it, it is it is not. There is an intervention. There is a yeah. clear intervention in the way uh, yeah. it's happening. Oh, it's interesting because he used to. He w w when he had a catalogue raisonné in two thousand four, I think it was. He opted in that book to classify his pictures um, as either documentary or cinematographic. And by cinematographic, he didn't mean it looked like cinema. He meant it involved preparation and collaboration. Because there were photographs that are as observational 
straightforwardly observational as a, as a Walker Evans. Uh, you're not building a set or a replica or lighting anything. You're not, it's, it's as documentary as documentary could be. So that got him into trouble, and then uh, <laughs> then he started using the term near documentary. What? Well, it's I don't have a criticism of that. I think it's a symptom of what I was mm. getting at in the talk. It's very difficult yeah. to, to dif the, the interesting practices are often very difficult yeah. to define. Pin down yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think we, we we could now take questions from the audience. I'm sure David's talk has. Uh, you know, stimulated a lot of people to, because we have quite a few photographers. Yes, please. Do you need a microphone? Yes. There you go. Thanks. Posterity awaits. Another part, thank you. Another part which is uh, focusing on what seems to be documentary, for example, that very well known picture by uh, Robert Donsi or whatever, that French photograph of the couple kissing, uh, you know, that the oh kiss, yeah, yeah which yeah. is supposed to uh, represent mm -hmm. Paris as a city yeah. of love, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which many years later, I think, when, the, when he died or whatever, much maybe like 30, 40 years later, he came to know it was a stage <laughs> thing. So, uh, that that is another kind. What is seen as documentary may not be. <coughs> Third is what uh, Steve McCurry, the greatest photojournalist we have, perhaps, uh, where uh, like the picture he shot in Delhi of this, uh, <coughs> you know, police with lots of uh, luggage on the head in uh, New Delhi station, which was a uh, whole uh, staged and uh, huge exercise, shopping for yeah. the suitcases and trunk first, and then shooting. And a lot of his pictures are that type. And he was obviously on the back of his hardcore uh, a documentary work, you would call in Afghanistan, Vietnam, whatever, yeah. uh, could pass off stuff which was obviously not. And that has created, as we all know, a lot of controversy around it. So now he uh, presents himself as a visual artist or something else, not as a you know news journalist, although he still uses yeah. and carries his photojournalism yeah. cards and whatever privileges that uh, yeah. come with it, you know. Yeah. So uh, you are having a variety of other larger questions. Mm -hmm. You see, these are questions what you have raised are more to the limited to the academia, to the collectors, the museum mm -hmm. practitioners and all of that. But mm -hmm. that is perhaps a bigger concern and that is a bigger concern because mm -hmm. uh, in this whole whatever post-truth and fake images and whatever we have, which is yeah. getting more and more complicated. Yeah. So uh, shouldn't that be a larger issue, A? B, uh, what do you think is, uh, you that know? That was already two parts, though. This oh, sorry. C. This oh. is C you're on now. I'm just yeah. trying to oh. mentally oh. remember. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, you know, uh, that that is obviously, in my opinion, I may not yes. be right, but that is perhaps a larger concern yeah. that most of us, even non-photographers, are wrestling with, you sure. know? Uh, and yeah. not just with this, even moving images have that kind of thing. Sure. Number, uh, now, uh, let's just keep it there. Otherwise, yeah, it's okay. confusing. Thank you. The first one, the first one is, well, they were all interesting. Thank you. I'll try and remember them. The first one about context, yeah, it's true. It's true. Um, obviously, the context in which an image is seen affects it. Obviously, photographs belong wherever you put them. Uh, it's very interesting. If you, if you see a painting reproduced in a book, you know the painting is somewhere else. If you see a photograph reproduced in a book, it's just there. There's no, there's no sense, like, where is the real, where's the thing? Um, so photography has a slightly kind of chameleon relation to its context. It just, it just seems to belong wherever it gets put. Billboard, on a wall, on a page, on a screen. 
that's a problem, but it's also in interesting and it kind of defines photography in a way. So, yes, there's a very interesting way in which you can trace the biography of an image, uh, which I've done a few times. Where was an image, where did an image first appear? Where did it appear next? Where did it, when did it make the jump from being in a news magazine to being acquired as a print by a museum? What exhibitions was it in? How did it then become a poster? Uh, why does it get talked about in certain ways in the context of art when the same photograph was not talked about? That, that's interesting. That, that's a kind of media history, media archaeology, and it's becoming a very important part of the way we talk about photographs, that, that a photograph is something that doesn't have meanings that just leap out of it. The, the meanings are largely dependent on the context and that you can, you can kind of trace, you can kind of tell the biography of a picture. That's, that's one thing. Um, y yes, I, I guess they were kind of art related, the ones I showed, although I don't know where that Alfred Eisenstadt picture by a photojournalist taken on a film set would have, would fit into all of that. Um, and yet there are lots of issues to do with um, protocols and expectations of what a news photograph should be or a, uh, a journalistic image should, should be. But the interesting thing is, as you rightly pointed out, those images themselves cannot guarantee their own status. All photographs require, in the last instance, someone to step in and speak on their behalf. This is not a film still. This was taken on a street. This happened. The image itself can never do that. That's why documentary and photojournalism grew up with language around them. Photographs, you can take a picture of me sneezing the photograph will never explain how I caught a cold. The photograph will never tell you if it's a real sneeze or if I was pretending to. Well, it just won't do that. So, it's, it, so the, what we attribute to photography as its documentary authority doesn't come from the image. It's part of it, but it doesn't, it doesn't come from the image. It, it comes from the writing around it. And this is why, you know, when, f when photojournalists put their images into photojournalism awards, they have to make statements on behalf of the image. Yes. The image won't do it. It never did. It's not a digital issue. It's not an AI issue. There were documentarists before photography. Charles Baudelaire, when he wrote mm -hmm. about the painter of everyday life, had in mind a, an illustrator, a guy called Constantine Gies, who I think was there at the Crimean War making sketches uh, that were reproduced in you know, London Illustrated News or the Parisian papers. I was there. This is what I saw. This is what was significant about it. That was drawing. But we... Once photography arrives, we think the automatism of photography, the automatic mm -hmm. part of it, is the source, is the guarantee of its status, and it's not. It doesn't undermine photography, but it just tempers it a little bit. That, that's what I'd say to the second part of what you were saying. I can't remember what the third part of the question was. I was trying to remember, but I can't. What was your first part? Well, it was a, this may be part of a smaller, uh, larger practice. Uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, this is more of an academic yeah. mm. discussion as yeah. opposed to the larger concern which may be beyond this, which may be beyond photo audiences entirely, you know? So. Yeah, I was talking about that with the, the, with the idea of the, e even if it's a so called art image, there are ways of reading it that aren't. Okay. Driven so by art. You could be a mechanic looking yeah. at a photograph, you could be a fashion. Uh, uh, yes, the other yeah. part was what is accepted uh, yeah. by way of image, image yeah. maker, and the reputation around it, and the publishing yeah. context. 
yeah. uh, such as Steve McCurry's work as we look at, which may yeah. be documentary but turns out to be stage or something like yeah. that. So, I mean, that, that is yeah. uh, changing entirely. You know? It is changing entirely and that will, but never, uh, that will never keep still. Just, just, just to uh, kind of interrupt mm. uh, a little bit. I know it, there are you know, questions. It, it's so it's a little uh, difficult to also, you know, an, an image that is made for a purpose with a change of context assumes new meaning. So in a way, uh, uh, David has made an exhibition, for example, uh, which he calls a handful of dust. And the, the key image there is one made by Man Ray of a Marcel Duchamp artwork. So it, its genesis is, uh, is as a documentary image. It's a pure, straightforward documentary mm -hmm. image. Mm -hmm. But then the biography of that image, what happens to it, he crops it and publishes it in the Surrealist magazine. And you know, it, it, through that, through time, that image begins to morph because uh, you, there might be an initial purpose to an image, but then the purpose, uh, that purpose is often lost. Mm. And mm. Uh, there are new purposes to which it is then put. So then it, is, it becomes very difficult to, make, to fix that image as yeah. documentary anymore. Mm -hmm. Like this one began as a documentary image. It's just a documentation yeah. of an artwork. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. you're very right on mm -hmm. that. Like if you mm -hmm. remember that whole Benetton campaign, I think the 80s where they yeah. decided to use hard news pictures yeah. to sell sweaters and all of that. Suddenly yeah. those pictures which are hardcore documentary sure. news reportage yeah. suddenly became yeah. something else. There Thank you. Okay. Hello. Okay. I must start by saying that I'm way more confused now than I entered the hall. Great. Good for you. <laughs> Mission <Okay>. accomplished. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And also, uh, with so many big names here, uh, it feels a bit phony to call myself a photographer right now. And but still, uh, mm -hmm. since we are talking about photography, but you've just published your first book. Congratulations! Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, my question, uh, my name is Soy uh, Abbreviation. So my question is that when we talk about photography and starting onto it, yeah. Uh, when does the photographer mm -hmm. or the artist mm -hmm. start reading their own work, their own photographs, or should they let the critic or the academics to do it or no, they should one should not at all. They should let the viewer do it. But again, doesn't that come back to the very thing of being conscious about shooting? Or it's, it's true that photographers are often anxiously keen to tell you their intentions. Why would they be anxiously keen? Because the images themselves won't convey that. That is the joy of photography. That is the position of, that is the privilege of the viewer. Um, I don't think an artist or a writer, I, this is something I try to avoid in my writing. I, I try to write around and discuss things. I, I, I don't write with judgment. I try not to write by saying this is good and this is bad and this is what this means. I tend to try and write out of interest and to try and expand the possibilities for the viewer. It, we, have a, we have particularly an art culture at the moment in which museums and galleries, in order to try to be accessible, started to tell viewers what things mean. It was a well-meaning, it was a well-intended thing to do, um, but it took away the, what should be the pleasure of responding to something. A responding to something can be a bit difficult. You can be a bit confused by something and, uh, and not sure, um, but there's no point running off to the artist or the critic for the script for looking, as I call it, uh, I think that's the script for looking is the problem. Uh, John Cage, the musician, had a lovely phrase. It's in his book, Silence. Uh, responsibility. 
two words though, not one, response, ability. The ability to respond and the responsibility to respond. Being a viewer is harder than we think. It's harder than museums in their rush to be populist <laughs> uh, <laughs> would like to imagine. But, you know, a, a, a good image, if you think about the images that you, for some unconscious reason, you keep coming back to over the years, or the novels you keep rereading, or the movies you keep reviewing, you're not doing it to have the same experience every time. The work stays the same and you change. And that's a, that's a beautiful thing. That's how you grow. And so it doesn't help, it doesn't help when an artist just wants to tell you why they're doing something or what things mean. Um, photographs don't, I'm always saying this, photographs don't have meanings the way a truck carries coal. dump. <laughs> Doesn't work. I don't think it works like that. But I take your I take your point that there's this there's, there's um that that gap of possible meaning often feels like um an abyss or a vacuum and we ought to avoid r rushing to fill it. We can make the we can make the gap or the vacuum a bit more inviting or a bit more interesting. Uh, but, we, but we shouldn't fill it. That's 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 the space of the viewer. So that sounds like a manifesto, but that's <laughs> <laughs> how I feel. Good. Oh. Hi there. Uh, very beautiful presentation. I really <coughs> loved it. Uh, at the start of the lecture, you talked about that the text and the image, you know, mm -hmm. uh, they always accompany it. Yeah. The moment the photograph arrived on Earth, text yeah. was already there. Right? So yeah. they have an, a deep association. You know, I'm just going back into this little when there was no photograph. So we have two kind of writers. One is the real little historian yeah. who tried to say this is real. And then the fiction writers, right? Staged yeah. and the documentary one. Yeah. You know, as a kind of analog to that. Yeah. So there was already kind of a, you know, a parallel to what but the photograph has picked up that kind of, you know, DNA of what was already happening in the yeah. times earlier. That is yeah. one curiosity which we are continuing to live with. Yeah. The idea of construct, you know, what mm -hmm. kind of construct we are moving through and oscillating between yeah. the stage and the documentary. That's mm -hmm. one curiosity. The mm -hmm. second is that, you know, in our worlds, we have this uh, huge kind of, let's say, burden on the photograph to represent, yeah. you know, yeah. because political ideas are running mm -hmm. through through and through because mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. too many issues and the photograph is a real thing there mm -hmm. so wherever there is a real action the photograph comes whether it is a construction or a stage or whatever mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. take it as a real and then there are contestations yeah. know, fights and political yeah. so the representational aspect of the photograph mm -hmm. is always there you know, even if it is staged that that changes the reality that's, that's what yeah. really fascinating maybe you can respond to that yeah, gosh, that's interesting. Yeah, always when I think of the the combination of photography and writing being there at the beginning, I, I think of um, Fox Talbot's The Pencil of Nature. You know, Talbot was the... There were many inventors of photography, and he was the English one. <laughs> and he published this... Well, it became a book, but it was actually published in six parts, where there were 24 photographs, each with a text. And it's still amazing to look at now because he's speculating. He's obviously saying, look, here is this new thing called photography. It doesn't have any uses yet. It doesn't have any functions yet. I mean, often when you ask people, stop someone in the street, you ask someone in the street, what is a photograph? They'll, they'll explain it to you through what people do with it. Um, so the very early writings on photography are interesting because nobody's doing anything with it yet. It's just this potential. And Tolbert writes, 
you know, well, it could have some kind of status of evidence. I don't know what that would be, he says. We'll have to leave it to the legal minds to decide. We're still deciding that now. It, it could be artistic. It could be thoroughly fictional, although he says even within its fiction, there is this extraordinary, what we would now call realism, this, you know, the automated detail. He says, you know, photographs have this excess in them beyond all intention always this just open up the lens and you get this stuff and he's fascinated by this and he knows that it's going to be it's going to destabilize things it's not whatever function you give it it's not it's not just going to behave itself in that function you're going to have to lock it down you're going to have to make sure that it behaves itself that's still the case now you know an artist desperate to tell you their intentions is trying to lock down yes. <laughs> uh, um, what was the second part the second part was more interesting <laughs> is he, the no, I've got two part <laughs> questions no I mean <laughs> <laughs> what was it uh, there, uh, actually there are many questions but I know you have, Go a, on. You have a great rest, you don't know, ability don't change your mind I want to hear one idea of the, you know, the problem of representationality in oh yes 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 Repre yeah, yeah. It's, that's a curious word isn't it that we think yeah, of representation yeah. in a political sense like 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 being present being account being but accounted for yeah. given the fact that we know somehow yeah. in our conscious mind or gotcha. conscious mind that that the photograph might be staged sure. but that at the same time it has an aspect of the real you know well i always i always think of the passport photo yeah. As you know, which lots of people have talked about in terms of being bound up with the power of the state and all the rest of it, we re we we are encouraged to re you know there are very strict conditions under which an image has to pass as a passport photo. Mm -hmm. um, but they're so strict that you and everyone knows sitting in a photo booth is the most staged <laughs> 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 theatrical <laughs> scenario, and yeah. you. You subject yourself to the gaze of the camera and the gaze of the state in order to get your passport, if you're lucky, which might permit you, you know, it's a bargain, it's a bargain we have to make. Um, we have a highly visual culture in which it's important that everyone is represented. Whether representation within visual culture, though, is going to mean political representation is another question. That's a very, very complicated one. And I've written a book with another guy called Stanley Wallachawanamba about that. In American visual culture, for example, we're getting to the point where everyone is visually present. That doesn't equate with a democratic politics. There's a kind of slight split, well, more than slight split, um, does, does, does visi will visibility lead to justice? Well, yes, it probably will, but it, it doesn't guarantee anything. Um, being, being visible in culture is a very, very important thing, but there is still this enormous leap between visual representation and, and political mm -hmm. representation. And we, we have to be careful not to slip one into the other, which often happens. That's the short answer. Sorry if it's a, that's another book length <laughs> matter. <Yeah. laughs> Hello. Um, thank you. Thank, thank you for a uh, very insightful Where are you? talk. Where are you? I'm oh, here. Hi, I'm hi, here. Hi, very insightful talk. I have I, I can I can have a long conversation but I resist that and I try and mm -hmm. make sense of one or two, two comments and a question, uh, just a speculative question. One is that uh, I was deeply actually influenced by Susan Sontag. Uh -huh. I read her when, when I was 19 years old. It changed my whole idea of representation, the idea of the palaces and the camera mm -hmm. and what it meant in terms of, and I was in then just in the beginning of doing a book on labor and it really influenced what how I shot and what I yeah. saw. Yeah. So um, uh, I wish I had that fan, fanboy moment you had. <laughs> sitting with her for a few hours, I would love to have had that, but I didn't. Uh, but uh, on, the, on the other comment on the idea of uh, 
institutional ethics and institutional uh, politics, we determine what image gets made, what image gets circulated. Yeah. And this is very much part of the ethics of photo making, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, it was very much part of photojournalism. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the photographer was not an individual shooting images. The photographer was part of an institutional chain of institutions which yeah. had the policy. So New York Times will show a certain image and will not show us other image. We know that from many photojournalistic mm -hmm. examples and mm -hmm. otherwise too. It then translated into advertising world, into what image got shown, how images got shown, uh, what was the world which is trying to create. Mm. So I just want to bring in this idea of uh, my inability to read photographs without the institutions surrounding it, both in ethical terms and political terms as well, and the worlds they make. So we grew up, I grew up looking at uh, Walker Evans, Diana Arbus, all these sort mm -hmm. of everybody mm -hmm. looks at. And image making became a form which was very much represented in that aesthetic, yeah. in a sense, without realizing uh, or having no information whether the farm great uh, farm administration or who was commissioning those images. Yeah. And uh, when I think back, I think it deeply influenced what was being shown and what was being shot. Mm -hmm. And uh, so these questions keep on coming to me with image making uh, mm -hmm. uh, of myself. And I often think of quantum physics like, you know, there's a famous example of Niels Bohr's experiment of the apparatus if you set up is the truth you get. Yeah. So if you set up for looking at quanta, you get the, the truth, and if you get looking at wave, you get it. In some ways, I think uh, the politics of image making cannot be dissociated with what you see, the visual world. And for example, uh, you know, we have the same image shot by a different person shoots it. So I'm just sort of thinking of whether the word documentary can be universalized as a universal idea, yeah. but it needs to be fractured itself, but what is the documentary? Documentary is like Niels Bohr's experiment of what you're trying, what who sees what, in a sense. So uh, it became the normative in the Western canon of aesthetic, but yeah. actually now with the, uh, with the millions of images being made every yeah. day, mm -hmm. the whole world changes because image making is no longer just for us, you know, 250 kilogram <laughs> museum piece, but people are making so images. Yeah, so the world has changed a lot. Mm. My co my so my speculative question is, so I mean, that's the two comments I want to make because I keep thinking about these things. Uh, uh, and how throat throat location, location <laughs> and where the person comes from. Yeah. I mean, I feel the, phot the photograph is more about the photographer's location in the world than the photograph itself. Mm -hmm. The photograph by shooting, any photographer is shooting it oneself more than, you know, how you read the <coughs> photograph. But in, th in the third sense of my speculative question, in a mm -hmm. sense, I will often think about stage and documentary. Uh, mm -hmm. And in a sense, I find that not only the documentary documents an event, but creates the event by documenting it. Because there is no event without the, without the photograph. The photograph creates the event which becomes the document yeah. of the event you're trying to create, sort sure. of cyclic like kind of thing. But then also the, uh, in a sense, the act of photography itself is setting a stage. Mm -hmm. So while we're looking at what the photograph is, photographer is photographing, the act of taking the framing and deciding what to frame is itself putting the world as a stage. And the I you cannot escape the idea of staging from the act of photography itself or taking the photograph itself. So no matter what you do, because the constructed photograph has a, has a, has a, has a postmodern twist to the history of photography mm -hmm. in the 70s, when the idea of truth became contested, I think, this is my reading of it. Mm. But then, even before that, I mean, not only what Robert Frank did with this photograph of this man dying, whatever, that's contested, uh, Ro Robert Kappa did that thing, mm -hmm. or, but also that uh, the act of taking a photograph, going to a war and taking a photograph, you're even a documented photograph, you're creating the war as a stage. Yeah. And the stage you created is institutionally determined because for example, the photograph of the Napalm, that girl running from Vietnam, mm -hmm. which it changed the war in a sense, in the Vietnam War. This wasn't the only photograph in the compact contact state. There were many other photographs. The, I think it was New York Times, decided to show that particular photograph. Mm -hmm. Something it can be think of the photograph without looking at the institutions behind that. And whether these categories we are, uh, we are drawing between documentary and stage is very art, art world, museum world, institutionally related. And in real life, I mean, I go back to Susan Sontag, whether mm -hmm. the relational aspect of the taking of the photograph itself becomes the most important act of seeing what is the photograph. Can I just uh, insert one little 
yeah. respond well, I, to I that. I want to just leave uh, that. Great. I would just leave that as a statement. I think that's great. It's very good. I mean, that's where I ended up, you know, mm -hmm. that the world, all, all photographs will theatricalize. All photographs may be of events, but they are obviously events in themselves and construct in being events. I mean, if you think of, sorry, just a sec. No, no. Um, <laughs> Come on. If you, it's very, you, um, you mentioned Robert Frank, and it wasn't supposed to be Robert Frank. That was a slip because it was Robert Kappa. But let's, let's go with Robert Frank and also go with Cartier Bresson, who, you know, the two of them made two of the you know, most well-known books, um, The Americans and The Decisive Moment. It's very interesting when you go through those books. In each book, um, all but one image is titled with a place and a date, effectively. But each book has one image. It's because they're photographing kind of everyday life, everyday things. So when you look at Cartier-Bresson's picture of the guy, you know, jumping over the puddle, um, it's an event because of the the photograph is the event. There isn't a there isn't a representation of drama. There is the drama of representation. Put it that way. That's good, isn't it? Yeah. I like that. Uh, so nobody's thinking, Jesus, did he survive? Did he fall over? Did he get his clothes wet? Wh who is he? N nobody thinks that. They just think, well, that's a gorgeous picture of everyday life. So it's fine that it's called Behind the Gare Saint-Lazare, 1932. The picture is the event, the way you frame. But in that book, there is a photograph um, taken at the liberation of the camps at the end of the war. And it's actually very difficult to work out what's going on. But you know it's the camps. You know, there are, you know there's literally people, Jews in stripy outfits, and there's what might be a Gestapo officer. And it's a, it's a, good, it's a good Gestapo officer. It's an informant being denounced. And Cartier Bresson knows that he can't just write Dessau, 1945, because there's clearly something of historical significance going on, although it doesn't explain itself. So his title is actually a caption uh, of explaining what's going on. Same thing in the Americans. There's a, there's a photograph of what looks like there's a tarpaulin over what looks like a human shape on the floor and four people standing. And clearly, something might have gone on. And Robert Frank writes, car accident between Flagstaff, Arizona, and wherever it is, and a date, I think. You know, it's like a gesture towards reportage or journalism. So in each of those books, they are mainly photographing the everyday, in where, where the picture is the event. But each book has a photograph of what we would think of as an event. And as, and as soon as the image is of something that we think of as an event, it requires a caption. It's really interesting. But, and I, I don't suppose they intended it. They were probably just going through their books and just thinking, oh, this needs a few more words. <laughs> but it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. I mean, I ended by saying, you know, f photographs turn the world into signs of itself enigmatic signs that might need accounting for. So they do, yeah, all photographs theatricalize. It's true. I agree. Sorry, Madam Anne. No, uh, I, I was trying to pick up on one uh, observation you made about the billions of images that are being made today. But this is also a very strange thing about photography. In almost every decade, you have somebody or more people coming and saying that there are more images than we need. Uh, if, if you just go back and look at uh, Victor Bergen uh, talking about how he began to work in the early 70s, and he began by working with, uh, you know, appropriating images. Then it was not called appropriated image, but he, that was what he was doing because he felt that there was an overabundance of images already, and he did not want to add more to that. 
So in every, uh, you know, every decade, there is this feeling that we have more than we need. And uh, like more recently, I think there were a, a spate of exhibitions called Tsunami of Images, Ocean of Images, but we've always been in an ocean of images. So uh, I don't think there is, there is there, you know, there's... The yeah. No, no, you, I, I, I was yeah, just I mean trying to gloss what... I mean what I, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I don't get through a week without somebody yeah. telling me there are too many images in the world. And my response, which is only partly sarcastic, is to say, how many would you like? <laughs> yeah. at, at, at what point was it kind of good? At, at what point was it comfortable? It was good, like a nice... Uh, it, it's interesting that it's always... The, the idea of tsunami and inundation and flood, flood particularly, uh, first comes up in the 20s with the expansion of the mass media. Yeah. You get writers, Walter Benjamin and Krakauer, Siegfried Krakauer, for example, who, who are talking about there being uh, not too many, but, that, that, but this expansion is going to disturb something. Um, an excess. M my feeling is that what's disturbing about photography, the excess of photography, is, n is in every image. Mm. It's not the number. Mm -hmm. it, it's what that automatic part of photography, the, e the excess that it brings, that's the source of the disturbance. I do think there's an excess of photography, mm. but it's in every image. It's not the number of them. I mm. think we blame Blessing. the number, mm. or we, we think that's the source of it. But it's, it's, it must be from every single image. The, the excess must and be. And I think the, it, it's the excess that is very difficult to contain, even in language, you know, to, ex to articulate. Uh, I know he uh, complains about there being too much yeah. writing in the world. Mm. Yes. <laughs> do they? Yes. Maybe they do. I don't know. It's just. Yeah. Too much information. Too much information. I don't. Too much information. Sorry. I think unstable yeah. information. I've been told yeah. this is the last question. Too. I can have that. Oh. This is the last question. It's a question uh, because you showed Bresson's. Uh, uh, just one thing. The great uh, fashion fashion guy who changes the way one looks at Sanders is Yoshi uh, Yamamoto, no? The green one, mm -hmm. this beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the brilliant way he reweaves Sanders. Yes, yeah, warmth, yeah. Right? yeah. almost nested in with the warmth. But I just wanted to ask a very different question because you talked about the 600 shot in the idea of Bresson taking 80 shots. But uh, one silver Bresson pickpocket, which mm. was very favorite, where yeah. this idea of reaching this point of uh, almost a sublime perfection of the self produces the ethical doubt. Yeah. Because in pickpocket, he can take any <coughs> pick, any pocket. Yeah. And he has practiced in such a way that after that, the craft almost flows parallel to him. Yeah. But that's the moment where he gets the ethical doubt. So I was just wondering whether this heightened sense of perfection of the image leads to this moment in Bresso as a part of the craft itself. Oh, I think that's brilliant. Yes, mm -hmm. I think lots of photographers feel that and face that. Too many opportunities. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's true. And I've always thought in, in that movie, Brasson's, what was it, 1959, I think? Pickpocket. I've, I've, always, I've always thought that that moment of where the pickpocket is so good at what he's done that he's transcended something is, uh, yeah, it, it is, a, is a sort of a metaphor for not mastery, uh, but, I, but I, w I wonder if Bresson in himself felt with that movie that he's, he's got to stop to something, he's got to some. I mean, he was always talking about transcendence somehow. Uh, 
That was Evans, interesting. Um, David, I think yeah. you, you need to. Oh, we need to wrap it up. Sorry. And, sorry. And actually well, I hope main that main has resolved yeah. nothing for you, yeah. but mm. maybe photography is fractionally more interesting. Thanks yeah. for coming. <laughs>